Many new laws go into effect across the country this week, and I explore what some of them are. Rick Singer, the disgraced college admissions fraudster, is sentenced to 3.5 years in prison. And in the wake of Pope Benedict XVI's funeral, I discuss what happens when a pope dies. I'm Julie Hartman, and this is Timeless. January 6th, 2023. You know, if we had half a cent or even a quarter or a tenth of a cent for the amount of times that that date, January 6th, has been said in the past two years, I think that all of us would be trillionaires. Don't worry. Today, I am not going to be talking about that disgraced event that occurred two years ago. But instead, I'm going to begin by discussing many new laws that have taken effect this week, effective on January 1st, 2023, that were voted on in the past midterm elections. And they range from crazy to crazier. But let's start first with a relatively benign one, which are the new minimum wage laws that are taking into effect. 27 states across the country are going to be seeing minimum wage increases. And out of the states that voted to increase their minimum wages, Washington state stands at the highest minimum wage with $15.74 an hour, and Montana currently has the lowest minimum wage at a shocking $9.95 an hour. Though, of course, we must bear in mind that the costs of living in Montana are significantly lower than they are in a Washington state. Interestingly, too, some states have higher minimum wages in their big cities. New York City, for instance, has a minimum wage that is $15 or 80 cents higher than what it is for the rest of the state. And the state of Oregon is going to set a higher minimum wage for the city of Portland. Now, being paid $9 or $15 an hour does seem, apropos of the name, like the bare minimum that an American worker deserves just to live and to get by. But the problem is that it seems that most of these minimum wage laws are being enacted in response to the widespread inflation that has gone on during President Biden's tenure in office. And a lot of this inflation has been caused by the fact that President Biden has been especially hard on the fossil fuel industry. Now you may think, what is, what is President Biden not liking fossil fuels have to do in, with inflation? Well, the answer is that when he starts to regulate that industry, when he makes it harder for companies to drill or to buy land to have their fracking, then the cost of everything goes up because oil accounts for so much of our daily lives. Think about how electricity works or how we uh, have cars drive or airplanes fly. So much of it is powered by oil and fossil fuels and natural gas. So when you start to make it harder for those industries to survive in the United States, the costs of everything are going to be jacked up. So understandably, and as we know, many people in the country are suffering. So in the midterm elections, they voted to increase the minimum wage. But the problem is that when you increase the minimum wage, a lot of companies, in order to offset the price of having to pay their workers more, they up the prices of their products. So in turn, it just seems to perpetuate and exacerbate the already existing inflation problem. If you look at the inflation rate under President Trump compared to President Biden, it is just staggering. Under President Trump, who supported the fossil fuel industry, he made it much easier compared to President Biden to have these companies get land and to drill. Under his presidency, inflation was at 1.8%. And under President Biden, it spiked up to 8.2%. Now it ranges in the 7% range which is still just unbelievable. And did you know, just as a fun fact, that the uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics 
in their calculation of inflation does not count food and fuel as part of their number. So even though they're saying that the inflation rate is in the 7% range, it actually is probably several percentage points higher or even double that because food and fuel accounts for so much of how all of us experience inflation. So we will have to see as to what the effects of those minimum wage laws are going to be. But although they sound like, again, the bare minimum thing to do for workers, I anticipate that it will only exacerbate our problems. Now, another major, major change that happened in this past midterm elections pertains to drug laws. Maryland and Missouri in November were two more states to vote to legalize recreational marijuana for those over 21. And this means that right now, 21 states in our union, plus the District of Columbia, have legalized recreational pot. And many people think that this is a great thing. Both sides of the argument with regard to cannabis legalization are understandable. On the one hand, it does seem a little bit silly to prevent people from buying a drug that is relatively benign compared to other drugs and a drug that also doesn't have a lethal overdose threshold. And the benefit of legalization obviously is that in many cases, perhaps in most cases, it's a lot safer than just buying pot off of the street, which is especially important right now with the ever growing fentanyl crisis that our country is facing. But as I talked about in my very first show on Timeless, we are also seeing unprecedented numbers of Americans using recreational marijuana. And relatedly, we are seeing unprecedented numbers of a never before seen phenomenon of marijuana induced psychosis. This is where people who take edibles or smoke a joint or hit a, a marijuana pen are experiencing high levels of paranoia and hallucination. And in turn, this can lead to more criminal activity. For, I'm not gonna go over all of those statistics and information again, because you can watch it on my very first episode. But the one thing that I will remind you of is that the reason why we are seeing so much marijuana-induced psychosis is because the concentrate of THC, which is the active ingredient in marijuana products, has increased over the past 60 years. So in the 1960s, marijuana products had a THC concentration of about 2%. In the 1990s, that increased to 5%. But today, it ranges from 30% to 90%. That's right, in some edibles that are being sold at dispensaries, the THC concentrate is 90%, which is leading, as I am telling you, to a lot of people experiencing some very scary effects. New York City public schools have announced that ca cannabis-related psychosis episodes have skyrocketed over the past few years. And just last month at a middle school not far from this studio, Van Nuys Middle School, they shut down school for the day because they had to hospitalize about 10 students who seemed to be displaying signs of a drug overdose, but really were experiencing marijuana-induced psychosis. Now, in addition to uh, Maryland and Missouri jumping on the pot legalization bandwagon, there is also a stunning drug-related legalization that has taken into effect this week. Colorado, and this is, I really can't believe this is just wild, Colorado has voted to legalize psychedelic mushrooms. So it's going to take a few months to roll out, but soon, in a few more months, people will not be criminalized for having psychedelic mushrooms. And in fact, you may be able to buy them at some dispensaries. So I don't know how you viewers are going to take this. I don't know if some of you are gonna get on the next flight to Colorado to have your dose of psychedelic mushrooms, or if some of you like me are scared by this, but I don't know, as fun as it may seem, I don't know how great the effects are going to be. I anticipate that we're going to be seeing a lot more crazy outbursts and unfortunately crime as a result of this. And if this is the direction that we're moving in, we really have something to fear. We should not be having 
in mass members of our population taking these hardcore drugs that make you hallucinate to the levels that mushrooms have? Do you, do you really think that a society or a civilization can be sustained or function with that? We'll see how it works out in Colorado. Now, another thing that's taken effect this week pertains to what those on the left call criminal justice reform, but what I call state-sanctioned murder. Illinois, this week, has officially become the first state to completely eliminate cash bail. Now, New York City has already done this, but obviously, needless to say, New York City is a city. The state of New York has not enacted this. But we have seen in New York City crime rates increase exponentially as a result of this law and as a result of fewer policing measures. But Illinois has gotten rid of cash bail entirely. So let me just quickly give you a little background on the function of cash bail and how the process works. So when someone is arrested for a crime, the police put them in jail. We know that. A judge then sets what their bail is which is a monetary number that they have to pay in order to be released from jail until their trial date. Most people have to put up 10% of their bail number in cash in order to be released from jail. We see that Sam Bankman Freed, for instance, was put into jail after his uh, fraud uh, crimes were exposed and his bail was set at 250 million, but because he or his parents or someone paid 25 million in cash, he was allowed to go free. So the purpose of bail is to provide a financial incentive for that person who was arrested to, to appear at their trial. So if you pay bail, you're allowed to go free, and then if you show up to your trial, you get that money back that you paid in bail. So again, it's a financial incentive to encourage, not encourage, make people show up to their trial. But in the past 60 years, as crime has proliferated in the United States, it has also primarily been used as a mechanism to keep violent criminals in jail. So what judges or prosecutors will do is that they will set a very high bail number that they know that the person behind bars cannot pay so that that person stays behind bars and doesn't go out and pose a danger to society. But many on the left have argued that this is an unfair system that benefits the rich because if rich people commit crime, they're in a better position to pay bail than a poor person who commits a crime may not be able to pay that bail. And look, there, there probably is several grains of truth to that argument. But as Tom Sowell so brilliantly says, there are no solutions in life, there are just trade-offs. We cannot achieve a perfectly fair system. And it would seem that we would all benefit more from having a system where prosecutors set a high bail so that they can keep a dangerous person behind bars than getting rid of bail and letting that person run free. And we are going to be seeing in Illinois that, in, in Illinois is already a state that has soaring crime, we are going to see so many people die and become injured as a result of this. Now it is important to note just for technical reasons that there are such things as dangerousness hearings which are still in place in Illinois. So if a judge or a prosecutor really deems the person who was arrested to be an incredible danger to the public, they can issue an order to keep them behind bars. But still, the fact that cash ba bail is going to be eliminated entirely in the state is going to mean that so many criminals who would otherwise have stayed behind bars are going to be out free in the meantime. And finally, I just want to read to you some crazy laws that are being enacted in this state that we are filming in right now, California. They don't fit into a specific category, but they do show overall the ideological rot of our policymakers. So first, and this is the most benign on the list, but first is that California, effective this week, has banned the sale and the manufacturing of fur products. And again, some people can seem to be sympathetic to this situation. 
I hate seeing animals being killed. I think in many cases it is a grotesque and terrible thing to sell for products. I get it. But is it really the position and the job of the federal government to intervene here and prohibit people from doing that? Again, I go back to the Tom Sowell quote, there are no solutions, there are only trade-offs. And the cost of allowing animals to be killed and fur to be sold is that, is that there is also a benefit of not having the government unnecessarily and tyrannically encroach on your life. Now there is a special carve out in this law that says that it doesn't apply to fur products that are being used for religious or for tribal reasons. But still, if you are a female in California who wants to buy a mink to look good in the holiday season, no longer. Another law in California is that pedestrians now can jaywalk without any punishment or recourse. Uh, the punishment or recourse would usually be a fine. And uh, California lawmakers have said that the reason why they are eliminating any kind of recourse for jaywalking is, you guessed it, it disproportionately affects people of color. So this is called the Freedom to Walk Act. As I was saying with the, the cash bail, I anticipate that this is going to cause a lot of people to die because when you normalize something and, and don't have consequences for something like jaywalking, people are going to do it more. And unfortunately, I think we can all anticipate that we're going to be seeing more pedestri pedestrian, excuse me, deaths. The third crazy California law that I want to alert you to is that there is a new bill that removes the requirement that you must be a citizen or a permanent resident of the United States in order to become a police officer. If we are going down that road, then isn't the next logical step to say that you don't have to be a citizen or a permanent resident of the United States in order to be the president? I know it seems like a big jump, but if you start allowing it at a small level, then you're going to allow it at a big level. In theory, I don't oppose a police officer being foreign born, but it's about the slippery slope. And it seems that citizens of this country should be the ones who are primarily in charge of the law enforcement. And finally, this one is perhaps the most out of nowhere as far as California laws. There is a new law that's called the Decriminalizing Artistic Expression Act. And it aims to restrict the use of rap lyrics as evidenced by prosecutors in criminal cases because supposedly that's racist. Apparently, sometimes in court, in order to prove that a person who has been arrested is violent or has violent ideations, they will play music that that person has produced. And California lawmakers have said that that is, of course, uh, a display of white supremacy. So no more rap in the courtroom. And remember, just alongside these different state laws, there's also this federal omnibus spending bill that I reported on a few days ago that has been approved this week that will allocate a few million dollars in our taxpayer money to, among other things, an LGBTQ museum and equity institutes that will help facilitate child transitions without parental consent. Now, some may say, oh, Julie, you bigot. Why do you oppose an LGBTQ museum? I don't oppose an LG LGBTQ museum, excuse me. I oppose our taxpayer money going towards it. Is that really the best use of our taxpayer money? Also, just as a little bit of fun, let's play a clip of what President Biden, who was a big proponent of this LGBTQ museum, once said about gay marriage. You know, think about this. The world's going to Hades in a handbasket, and we're going to debate the next three weeks, I'm told, gay marriage and God only knows what else. I can't believe the American people can't see through this. We already have a law. The Defense of Marriage Act, where we've all voted, not where I voted and others said, look, marriage is between a man and a woman, and states must respect that. Oh, that is just too good. Speaking of good news, the Varsity Blues college admissions fraudster Rick Singer has gotten three and a half years of a sentence in prison. 
Some of you may know from the many documentaries and podcasts that have been released about this that Rick Singer ran an operation with several dozen parents, uber wealthy parents, where he helped these parents bribe college coaches to flag their kids as potential recruited athletes, even though they weren't, to help those kids get into college. Another part of Singer's fraud scheme is that he had people take tests on behalf of these wealthy kids in order to jack up their SAT scores and again, increase their chances of getting into a fancy school. So this fraud was famously exposed back in March of 2019. And though it has taken a few years, finally, Rick Singer is getting some of what he deserves. And one song kept coming into my head as I read this story that he was being sentenced. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Now look, especially nowadays, we should all look for good news where we can find it. But some are saying, and rightfully so, that Rick Singer should have gotten a lot more time than just three and a half years behind bars. It seems that he will probably end up only serving two years of that sentence. And Rick Singer was only ordered to pay $20 million in total in restitution. Well, actually, $10 million went to restitution to the IRS. $5.3 million is required of him to be handed over in assets. And then $3.4 million is required to be handed over in forfeiture and money judgment. But still, that's a net total of a $20 million loss uh, of Rick Singer. But Rick Singer made $25 million as a part of his fraud scheme. And some say that that's a low estimate. So although, again, we should rejoice that he is getting his due, he probably should have gotten a lot more. But that's just our weak system nowadays, where even people like Rick Singer, who really deserve it, people are hesitate to incarcerate him. Now, before we move on from this story, I want to stop and tell you about a personal story about my high school that pertains to this college admission scandal. Because although it's great that, again, Rick Singer is being prosecuted, there are still so many backdoor college admission scandals that have been allowed to run rampant in this country without any kind of regulation. And so when I was in high school, we used to, and, and by the way, I just want to say, I loved my high school when I was there. Unfortunately, as it has succumbed to wokeism now, but when I was there, I loved my teachers. I made so many friends, who many of whom are my friends to this day. I learned a lot and I'm very grateful for that experience. In ninth grade, we used to take our midterm and final examinations in the gym, which is needless to say, huge. And when you were done with your final exam and you would leave the gym, you would walk by or I, I should say I would walk by other classrooms where, peop, where students who got extra time on tests would be taking their exams. But then as I got into 10th grade or 11th grade, the school decided to move us out of the gym and into the library, which is a much smaller structure. And so that was sort of noteworthy and confusing, and I didn't really understand it. But I remember after I left my first exam in the library, when I walked past the other classrooms in the school, I saw more and more and more classrooms being occupied by people who were getting extra time on tests. And again, at the risk of sounding unkind, I would look at some of my peers who would be in those classrooms and I would go, wait a minute, you didn't have extra time, you didn't get an extra time uh, exemption or extension rather on that on tests a year ago or that person doesn't have a learning disability. And what happened is this fad caught on where people figured out that they could get a doctor's note and the doctor could claim that that person had a disability and that that person would get extra time on the SAT or on the, or on the midterm or final examinations. Time is everything on those tests. Part of what they are testing you on is your ability to perform under pressure. So it is completely unfair for someone, some students, to get more and more time than others. And so I did some research on this, and according to the College Board, 
90% of students who petition or submit a doctor's form for extra time get approved. And on top of that, teachers are not required to report to colleges that their students got extra time on the tests they administered. And the SAT and the ACT are not required to report to colleges that the student got extra time when taking the test. So this just created a wide open incentive for people to participate in this fraud scheme. And it is a fraud scheme because it is unfair that certain private school, especially rich students, can go pay off a doctor to get a note to say they have a phony learning disability, to get extra time on a test, to get a higher score and get into a better college. That is unfair to other people who do not have the resources to get a doctor's note to do that. Not to mention, it is totally unfair to people who do have legitimate learning disabilities. So what I hope will come out of this Rick Singer scandal, unfortunately we haven't really seen it come out in the past few years, but maybe I'll be the one who leads the charge, is that Rick Singer is just the tip of the egregious iceberg. He is the most famous example, or the most blatant, or as I just said, egregious example of fraud. But there are so many more clandestine or in, insidious ways that people scan the system. And it's BS, and it's sick, and it needs to be called out. On that note, let's talk about the Pope. <laughs> Yesterday was the funeral of Pope Benedict XVI, who was the Pope from 2005 to 2013. And he was the first Pope to abdicate the throne in over 500 years, close to 600 years. He was just five feet, seven inches tall, and he was known as a brilliant yet uncharismatic academic. Pope Benedict was born in Germany in 1927, and he was the first German Pope to serve in over half a millennium. Pe many people saw that election as a great step forward for Germany in terms of their religious and moral renewal after the Holocaust. Interestingly, when Pope Benedict was 14 in 1941, he was automatically enlisted in the Hitler Youth through his school. And though he did serve some time in the military, which again was forced, he quickly deserted the German army army, excuse me, and sought refuge among American soldiers until the war ended in 1945. Pope Benedict was considered to be a pretty conservative pope. He came out strongly against what he saw as the secularization and the liberalization of the papacy and of the Catholic Church that especially has come to fruition in the wake of Vatican II, which was the famous meeting of Catholic leaders in the 1960s, which, among other things, got rid of the requirement to have Catholic masses be spoken in Latin. Pope Benedict eased the restrictions on that, so he wanted to bring back more Catholic churches delivering the masses in Latin, and he also reinstated a lot of papal regalia, which are called papal vestments, to confer more legitimacy and regality upon the position. Also, as a fan of Mozart, Bach, and classical music, he spoke publicly about his worries that rock and roll music was corrupting the minds of youth. And he even criticized Harry Potter, saying that he wasn't sure if those stories were a good influence on young people. But still, Pope Benedict's beliefs could not be put into a box. In some ways, he had what some would consider to be liberal positions. For instance, he came out immediately against the United States war in Iraq in the early 2000s. He supported several pro-environmentalist initiatives throughout his time as pope. He actually criticized capitalism in 2008 in the wake of the American and worldwide financial crisis. And he eased the rules for conversion for Anglicans, which more traditional hardline Catholics saw as an affront to the Catholic faith. So I want to talk to you a little bit about the protocol of what happens when a pope dies and how the funeral is planned. Because what we saw yesterday, a pope's funeral, is one of those events in the world that perhaps has the most pomp and circumstance. 
even more than a presidential inauguration or a presidential funeral. And I would argue that, that uh, P Pope's funerals go toe to toe with a monarch's funeral or a coronation. But first, let me tell you a little bit about the hierarchy of the Catholic Church and why the Pope gets such a massive and uh, full funeral. So at the top of the ladder, obviously, is the Pope. The Pope, there's usually one of them, and right now the Pope is Pope Francis. But in the past 10 years, there have been two popes because Pope Benedict broke protocol by retiring in his lifetime. So Pope Benedict, throughout his lifetime, uh, after he retired, was referred to as Pope Emeritus. And the Pope is addressed as Your Holiness. And he is seen as the head of the Catholic Church and the Bishop of Rome, the head of the Holy See. The Holy See refers to the jurisdiction of the Pope, which is in the Vatican. And the Vatican is a sovereign city-state within Rome. So that's number one, Pope's at the top. Number two are cardinals. There are 224 cardinals currently, and 125 of those cardinals are cardinal electors, who are the cardinals who elect the pope when that time comes. You can only be a cardinal elector, though, if you are under the age of 80. So maybe the Catholic Church has the idea that your <laughs> mental acumen starts to decline over the age of 80. And cardinals are referred to as your eminence, and their primary responsibility is to serve the Pope and his goals and needs across the diocese. Number three out of four on the totem pole are bishops. There are 5,600 bishops currently. They are referred to as Your Excellency, and their primary tasks are to set and adjust church laws. And then finally, of course, there are priests. As of last year, there were 414,000 priests worldwide, and they serve as head of individual Catholic churches, and they are referred to as Father or Monsignor. And so I tell you that hierarchy, uh, in addition to my belief that it is just interesting, also each of these roles play, uh, each of these uh, positions, I should say, play important roles in the election of the Pope and the funeral of the Pope. So when a pope dies, it's not just like a regular death where his body is carted out of whatever room he died in and taken to a funeral home. There are several fascinating sort of old world procedural and symbolic things that have to happen first. First, when the pope dies, the first person to be notified is someone called the Comerlengo. That's spelled C-A-M-E-R-L-E-N-G-O. The Comerlengo serves as the administrator of property and revenues for the Holy See. But his biggest responsibility is that he oversees the protocol when the Pope dies in the transition from one Pope to another Pope. So when the Pope dies, the Comerlengo is called into the monastic chambers and he stands over the dead body of the Pope and he calls out the Pope's birth name or baptismal name three times. And if the Pope, if and when the Pope, there's really, a, a, to our knowledge, there hasn't been a time in history where the Pope has woken up and responded. So when the Pope doesn't respond to his birth name being called out three times by the Comerlengo, then the Comerlengo can pronounce him as dead and refer to the Cardinal Vicar of the Diocese of Rome to bring about a death certificate. So Pope Benedict XVI's real name is not Benedict. His real name is Joseph Ratzinger. So when the Carmelango stood over his body, he called out Joseph Ratzinger three times. The way that popes, by the way, decide their names is interesting. They name themselves, and they tend to name themselves after saints or after previous popes. So in the case of Pope Benedict, he named himself after Saint Benedict and after Benedict, Pope Benedict XV, who was known for mobilizing a lot of Catholics to do incredible missionary and humanitarian work during World War I. So when that official declaration of death is issued by the Cardinal Vicar of Rome, then there starts a nine-day mourning period for the death of the Pope. And according to protocol, the Pope's funeral has to be held either on the 4th, 5th, 
or sixth day of that nine day mourning period. So Pope Benedict XVI died on the last day of 2022 on December 31st, and his funeral was yesterday, January 5th. So that falls into the, to the three days. It, it's on the fifth day after his death in the mourning period. So the second duty of the Camerlengo, after he calls out the three names of the Pope's birth name and uh, gives the okay for the death certificate to be issued, his second duty is to cut the telephone lines of the Pope, to lock the Pope's desk, to lock the doors inside of the Pope's apartment, and to seal the main door of the Pope's apartment with red ribbons. This was done in the olden days to prevent cardinals from coming into the Pope's chambers and looting his items. And in recent times, they have added that, uh, that protocol to cut telephone lines because they don't want people to sneak in and make a phone call impersonating the dead Pope. And the third and final responsibility after the death of the Pope by the Camerlengo is perhaps the most symbolically significant. And that is the Camerlengo has to arrange for the breaking of the Pope's ring. Some of you may know or have seen on TV that the Pope wears this big, it looks like it's made of gold, but it's actually made of silver ring. And that is called the fisherman's ring. And it's called that because it, it, the story originates with St. Peter, who is believed to have been the first Pope. And the idea of a fisherman's ring comes from the part of the New Testament where Jesus supposedly said to St. Peter, quote, you are a fisherman, I will make you a fisher of men. Meaning that Jesus was mandating that St. Peter cast his line into the sea of humanity and try to reel in or bring in people to Christianity and to Jesus. So the signet ring that the Pope wear, or Pope, uh, yeah, I guess, wears, is a sign of his authority. And on the ring, they embroider the Pope's name, and they have a picture of St. Peter, again, who was believed to have been the first Pope. So when the Pope dies, the Camerlengo arranges for the destruction of that ring. And he calls in people who break the ring with a special pair of silver shears or scissors in order to symbolically indicate that the Pope is dead and his authority is passed and now it is time for a new Pope. But as I have said, in the case of Pope Benedict, there isn't a new Pope when he dies because Pope Benedict retired and then Pope Francis came into the tenure of Pope. So during Pope Benedict's funeral yesterday, it was the first time in history that a current Pope preside, presided over a previous Pope's funeral. And so what happens is, after the Pope dies, the Pope's body is allowed to be uh, lied in state in St. Peter's Basilica, where people can come in, mourners can come in, and pay their respects. But unlike, for instance, Queen Elizabeth, whose body also lied in state and mourners were allowed to come pay their respects, when the Pope's body lies in state, it is, the Pope's body is an open casket. You can see the dead body of the Pope, which is pretty jarring. But of course, for the funeral, the Pope is put into a wooden casket and that casket is sealed. As I mentioned yesterday, the Pope leaves detailed instructions for his fun funeral before he dies of what kind of ceremony he wants and who he wants to attend. And it is quite customary to have papal funerals be world events where many world leaders come together. In fact, John Paul II's funeral was the biggest gathering of world leaders ever outside of the United Nations. He had nine monarchs and 70 presidents and prime ministers come to his funeral. But Pope Benedict XVI made the stunning move of indicating that he did not want President Joe Biden to come to his funeral. Instead, according to White House Press Secretary Corrine Jean-Pierre, he instructed that he wanted John Donnelly, who is the U.S. ambassador to the Holy See, to attend and represent the United States instead of President Biden, which is especially staggering given that President Biden is only the second Catholic president to ever serve in United States history. 
So I'm putting up some pictures of the funeral yesterday. It was beautiful. One of the things that was different about it is that they recited different prayers because the Pope was not a current Pope. And a lot of people in the crowd chanted Santo Subito as the casket went by them, which means saint immediately, which reflects a lot of Catholics views that, the, that Pope Benedict should be exalted into sainthood. It is quite common for popes to uh, get sainthood status once they die. And finally, one of the interesting tidbits about the Pope's funeral yesterday is that every time a, a Pope dies, a scroll is placed inside his casket. And the scroll attempts to synopsize the Pope's contribution during his tenure. And one of the things that the scroll yesterday for Pope Benedict XVI said is that he was, quote, firmly against pedophilia, which indicates that Pope Benedict XVI wanted his legacy to be that he vehemently opposed many of the pedophilia scandals that have surrounded the Catholic Church in recent years. Thank you all so much for joining today. I hope that you enjoyed this. And remember, like a sculptor, starting with a block of clay and the tools to form it, each of our thoughts, choices, and actions shapes who we are. So let's think clearly, choose wisely, and act with principle and determination. Take care. Mm -hmm.